William Howard Taft served as the 27th President of the United States and as the 10th Chief Justice of the United States. The only person to have held both offices, Taft was elected president in 1908, the chosen successor of Theodore Roosevelt, but was defeated for re-election by Woodrow Wilson in 1912 after Roosevelt split the Republican vote by running as a third-party candidate. In 1921, President Warren G. Harding appointed Taft to be Chief Justice, a position in which he served until a month before his death. Taft was born in Cincinnati in 1857. His father, Alfonso Taft, was a U.S. Attorney General and Secretary of War. William Taft attended Yale and was a member of Skull and Bone Secret Society like his father, and after becoming a lawyer was appointed a judge while still in his 20s. He continued a rapid rise being named Solicitor General and as a judge of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. In 1901, President William McKinley appointed Taft civilian governor of the Philippines. In 1904, Roosevelt made him Secretary of War, and he became Roosevelt's hand-picked successor. Despite his personal ambition to become Chief Justice, Taft declined repeated offers of appointment to the Supreme Court of the United States, believing his political work to be more important. With Roosevelt's help, Taft had little opposition for the Republican nomination for president in 1908, and easily defeated William Jennings Bryan for the presidency that November. In the White House, he focused on East Asia more than European affairs and repeatedly intervened to prop up or remove Latin American governments. Taft sought reductions to trade tariffs, then a major source of governmental income, but the resulting bill was heavily influenced by special interests. His administration was filled with conflict between the conservative wing of the Republican Party, with which Taft often sympathized, and the progressive wing, toward which Roosevelt moved more and more. Controversies over conservation and over antitrust cases filed by the Taft administration served to further separate the two men. Roosevelt challenged Taft for renomination in 1912. Taft used his control of the party machinery to gain a bare majority of delegates, and Roosevelt bolted the party. The split left Taft with little chance of re-election. He took only Utah and Vermont in Wilson's victory. After leaving office, Taft returned to Yale as a professor, continuing his political activity and working against war through the League to enforce peace. In 1921, President Harding appointed Taft as Chief Justice, an office he had long sought. Chief Justice Taft was a conservative on business issues, but under him, there were advances in individual rights, in poor health. He resigned in February 1930. After his death the next month, he was buried at Arlington National Cemetery, the first president and first Supreme Court justice to be interred there. Taft is generally listed near the middle in historians' rankings of U.S. presidents. Early Life and Education William Howard Taft was born September 15, 1857 in Cincinnati, Ohio, to Alfonso Taft and Louise Torrey. William Taft was not seen as brilliant as a child, but was a hard worker. Taft's demanding parents pushed him and his four brothers toward success, tolerating nothing less. He attended Woodward High School in Cincinnati, at Yale College, which he entered in 1874. The heavyset, jovial Taft was popular. One classmate described him succeeding through hard work rather than being the smartest, and as having integrity. Rise in government Ohio lawyer and judge After admission to the Ohio bar, Taft devoted himself to his job at the commercial, full-time. Halstead was willing to take him on permanently at an increase in salary if he would give up the law, but Taft declined. In October 1880, Taft was appointed assistant prosecutor for Hamilton County, where Cincinnati is located, and took office the following January.
Taft served for a year as assistant prosecutor, trying his share of routine cases. In 1887, Taft, then aged 29, was appointed to a vacancy on the Superior Court of Cincinnati by Governor Joseph B. Foraker. The appointment was good for just over a year, after which he would have to face the voters. And in April 1888, he sought election for the first of three times in his lifetime, the other two being for the presidency. He was elected to a full five-year term. Some two dozen of Taft's opinions as state judge survive, the most significant being Moores & Co. v. Bricklayers Union No. 1. It is not clear when Taft met Helen Heron, often called Nellie, but it was no later than 1880, when she mentioned in her diary receiving an invitation to a party from him. By 1884, they were meeting regularly, and in 1885, after an initial rejection, she agreed to marry him. The wedding took place at the Heron home on June 19, 1886. William Taft remained devoted to his wife throughout their almost 44 years of marriage. Nellie Taft pushed her husband much as his parents had, and she could be very frank with her criticisms. Solicitor General There was a seat vacant on the U.S. Supreme Court in 1889, and Governor Foraker suggested President Harrison appoint Taft to fill it. Taft was 32 and his professional goal was always a seat on the Supreme Court. He actively sought the appointment, writing to Foraker to urge the governor to press his case, while stating to others it was unlikely he would get it. Instead, in 1890, Harrison appointed him Solicitor General of the United States. When Taft arrived in Washington in February 1890, the office had been vacant two months. With the work piling up, he worked to eliminate the backlog, while simultaneously educating himself on federal law and procedure he had not needed as an Ohio state judge. New York Senator William M. Everts, a former Secretary of State, had been a classmate of Alfonso Taft at Yale. Although Taft was successful as Solicitor General, winning 15 of the 18 cases he argued before the Supreme Court. Federal Judge Taft's federal judgeship was a lifetime appointment, and one from which promotion to the Supreme Court might come. Taft's older half-brother Charles, successful in business, supplemented Taft's government salary, allowing William and Nellie Taft and their family to live in comfort. Taft's duties involved hearing trials in the circuit, which included Ohio, Michigan, Kentucky, and Tennessee, and participating with Supreme Court Justice John Marshall Harlan, the Circuit Justice, and judges of the Sixth Circuit in hearing appeals. Taft spent these years, from 1892 to 1900, in personal and professional contentment. According to historian Louis L. Gould, while Taft shared the fears about social unrest that dominated the middle classes during the 1890s, he was not as conservative as his critics believed. He supported the right of labor to organize and strike, and he ruled against employers in several negligence cases. Quote, In 1896, Taft became dean and professor of property at his alma mater, the Cincinnati Law School, a post that required him to prepare and give two-hour-long lectures each week. Philippine Years In January 1900, Taft was called to Washington to meet with McKinley. Taft hoped a Supreme Court appointment was in the works, but instead McKinley wanted to place Taft on the commission to organize a civilian government in the Philippines. The appointment would require Taft's resignation from the bench. The president assured him that if he fulfilled this task, McKinley would appoint him to the next vacancy on the high court. Taft accepted on condition he was made head of the commission, with responsibility for success or failure. McKinley agreed, and Taft sailed for the islands in April 1900. The American takeover meant the Philippine Revolution bled into the Philippine. American War, as Filipinos fought for their independence. But U.S. 
forces, led by military Governor General Arthur MacArthur, Jr. Taft sought to make the Filipinos partners in a venture that would lead to their self-government. He saw independence as something far off. Many Americans in the Philippines viewed the locals as racial inferiors. But Taft wrote soon before his arrival, we propose to banish this idea from their minds. McKinley was assassinated in September 1901 and was succeeded by Theodore Roosevelt. Taft and Roosevelt had first become friends around 1890 while Taft was Solicitor General and Roosevelt a member of the Civil Service Commission. Taft had, after McKinley's election, urged the appointment of Roosevelt as Assistant Secretary of the Navy and watched as Roosevelt became a war hero, governor of New York, and vice president of the United States. They met again when Taft went to Washington in January 1902 to recuperate after two operations caused by an infection. In late 1902, Taft had heard from Roosevelt that a seat on the Supreme Court would soon fall vacant on the resignation of Justice George Shiras and Roosevelt desired that Taft fill it. Although this was Taft's professional goal, he refused as he felt his work as governor was not yet done. Secretary of War When Taft took office as Secretary of War in January 1904, he was not called upon to spend much time administering the army, which the president was content to do himself. Roosevelt wanted Taft as a troubleshooter in difficult situations, as a legal advisor, and to be able to give campaign speeches as he sought election in his own right. Taft strongly defended Roosevelt's record in his addresses, and wrote of the president's successful but strenuous efforts to gain election. I would not run for president if you guaranteed the office. It is awful to be afraid of one's shadow. Quote, between 1905 and 1907, Taft came to terms with the likelihood he would be the next Republican nominee for president, though he did not plan to actively campaign for it. When Justice Henry B. Brown resigned in 1905, Taft would not accept the seat although Roosevelt offered it, a position Taft held to when another seat opened in 1906. Alternatively, Taft wanted to be Chief Justice, and kept a close eye on the health of the aging incumbent, Melville Fuller, who turned 75 in 1908. Taft believed Fuller likely to live many years. Roosevelt had indicated he was likely to appoint Taft if the opportunity came to fill the court's center seat, but some considered Attorney General Philander Knox a better candidate. In any event, Fuller remained Chief Justice throughout Roosevelt's presidency through the 1903 separation of Panama from Colombia and the Habanao Varilla Treaty. The United States had secured rights to build a canal in the Isthmus of Panama. Legislation authorizing construction did not specify which government department would be responsible, and Roosevelt designated the Department of War. Taft journeyed to Panama in 1904, viewing the canal site and meeting with Panamanian officials. The Isthmian Canal Commission had trouble keeping a chief engineer, and when in February 1907 John D. Stevens submitted his resignation, Taft recommended an army engineer, George W. Gothels. Under Gothels, the project moved ahead smoothly. Another colony lost by Spain in 1898 was Cuba, but his freedom for Cuba had been a major purpose of the war. It was not annexed by the U.S., but was, after a period of occupation, given independence in 1902. Election fraud and corruption followed, as did factional conflict. In September 1906, President Tom S. Estrada Palma asked for U.S. intervention. Taft traveled to Cuba with a small American force, and on September 29, 1906, under the terms of the Cuban-American Treaty of Relations of 1903, declared himself provisional governor of Cuba, a post he held for two weeks before being succeeded by Charles Edward Magoon. In his time in Cuba, Taft worked to persuade Cubans that the U. 
S. Intended stability, not occupation. Taft remained involved in Philippine affairs. During Roosevelt's election campaign in 1904, he urged that Philippine agricultural products be admitted to the U.S. without duty. This caused growers of U.S. sugar and tobacco to complain to Roosevelt, who remonstrated with his Secretary of War. Taft expressed unwillingness to change his position and threatened to resign. On both of his Philippine trips as Secretary of War, Taft went to Japan and met with officials there. Presidential election of 1908 Gaining the nomination Roosevelt had served almost three and a half years of McKinley's term. On the night of his own election in 1904, Roosevelt publicly declared he would not run for re-election in 1908, a pledge he quickly regretted, but he felt bound by his word. Roosevelt believed Taft was his logical successor, although the war secretary was initially reluctant to run. One of a series of candid photographs known as the evolution of a smile, taken just after a formal portrait session, as Taft learns by telephone from Roosevelt of his nomination for president, a number of Republican politicians, such as Treasury Secretary George Cortelyu, tested the waters for a run but chose to stay out. New York Governor Charles Evans Hughes ran, but when he made a major policy speech, Roosevelt the same day sent a special message to Congress warning in strong terms against corporate corruption. The resulting coverage of the presidential message relegated Hughes to the back pages. Assistant Postmaster General Frank H. Hitchcock resigned from his office in February 1908 to lead the Taft effort. General Election Campaign Taft's opponent in the general election was Bryan, the Democratic nominee for the third time in four presidential elections. As many of Roosevelt's reforms stemmed from proposals by Bryan, the Democrat argued that he was the true heir to Roosevelt's mantle. Corporate contributions to federal political campaigns had been outlawed by the 1907 Tillman Act, and Bryan proposed that contributions by officers and directors of corporations be similarly banned, or at least disclosed when made. Taft was only willing to see the contributions disclosed after the election, and tried to ensure that officers and directors of corporations litigating with the government were not among his contributors. Taft began the campaign on the wrong foot, fueling the arguments of those who said he was not his own man by traveling to Roosevelt's home at Sagamore Hill for advice on his acceptance speech saying that he needed the president's judgment and criticism. Taft upset some progressives by choosing Hitchcock as chairman of the Republican National Committee, RNC, placing him in charge of the presidential campaign. Hitchcock was quick to bring in men closely allied with big business. Roosevelt, frustrated by his own relative inaction, showered Taft with advice fearing that the electorate would not appreciate Taft's qualities, and that Bryan would win. Roosevelt's supporters spread rumors that the president was in effect running Taft's campaign. This annoyed Nellie Taft, who never trusted the Roosevelts. Bryan urged a system of bank guarantees, so that depositors could be repaid if banks failed. But Taft opposed this, offering a postal savings system instead. In the end, Taft won by a comfortable margin. Taft defeated Bryan by 321 electoral votes to 162. However, he garnered just 51.6% of the popular vote. Presidency Inauguration and Appointments Taft was sworn in as president on March 4, 1909, due to a winter storm that coated Washington with ice. Taft was inaugurated within the Senate chamber rather than outside the Capitol as is customary. The new president stated in his inaugural address that he had been honored to have been one of the advisors of my distinguished predecessor and to have had a part in the reforms he has initiated. I should be untrue to myself. 
to my promises, and to the declarations of the party platform on which I was elected if I did not make the maintenance and enforcement of those reforms the most important feature of my administration. Soon after the Republican convention, Taft and Roosevelt had discussed which cabinet officers would stay on. Taft kept only Agriculture Secretary James Wilson and Postmaster General George Van Langerk Meyer, who was shifted to the Navy Department. Others appointed to the Taft cabinet included Philander Knox, who had served under McKinley and Roosevelt as Attorney General, as the new Secretary of State, and Franklin McFaw as Treasury Secretary. Taft did not enjoy the easy relationship with the press that Roosevelt had, choosing not to offer himself for interviews or photo opportunities as often as his predecessor had. Foreign Policy Organization and Principles Taft made it a priority to restructure the State Department, noting, it is organized on the basis of the needs of the government in 1800 instead of 1900. Quote, there was broad agreement between Taft and Knox on major foreign policy goals. The U.S. would not interfere in European affairs, and would use force if necessary to enforce the Monroe Doctrine in the Americas. The defense of the Panama Canal, which was under construction throughout Taft's term, it opened in 1914, guided United States foreign policy in the Caribbean and Central America. Previous administrations had made efforts to promote American business interests overseas, but Taft went a step further and used the web of American diplomats and consuls abroad to further trade. Such ties, Taft hoped, would promote world peace, tariffs and reciprocity. At the time of Taft's presidency, protectionism through the use of tariffs was a fundamental position of the Republican Party. Serena E. Payne, chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, had held hearings in late 1908 and sponsored the resulting draft legislation. On balance, the bill reduced tariffs slightly, but when it passed the House in April 1909 and reached the Senate, the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, Rhode Island Senator Nelson W. Aldrich, attached to many amendments raising rates. This outraged progress of such as Wisconsin's Robert M. La Follette, who urged Taft to say that the bill was not in accord with the party platform. Taft refused, angering them. When opponents sought to modify the tariff bill to allow for an income tax, Taft opposed it on the ground that the Supreme Court would likely strike it down as unconstitutional, as it had before. Instead, they proposed a constitutional amendment, which passed both houses in early July, was sent to the states, and by 1913 was ratified as the 16th Amendment. In the conference committee, Taft won some victories, such as limiting the tax on lumber. The conference report passed both houses, and Taft signed it on August 6, 1909. The Payne-Aldrich tariff was immediately controversial. According to Coletta, Taft had lost the initiative, and the wounds inflicted in the acrid tariff debate never healed. Newton McConnell cartoon showing Canadian suspicions that Taft and others were only interested in Canada when prosperous. In Taft's annual message sent to Congress in December 1910, he urged a free trade accord with Canada. Britain at that time still handled Canada's foreign relations and Taft found the British and Canadian governments willing. Many in Canada opposed an accord, fearing the U.S. would dump it when convenient as it had the 1854 Elgin Marcy Treaty in 1866, and farm and fisheries interests in the United States were also opposed. After January 1911 talks with Canadian officials, Taft had the agreement, which was not a treaty introduced into Congress and it passed in late July. The Canadian Parliament, led by Prime Minister Sir Wilfrid Laurier, had deadlocked over the issue. Canadians turned Laurier out of office in the September 1911 election and Robert Borden became the new Prime Minister. 
no cross-border agreement was concluded, and the debate deepened divisions in the Republican Party. Latin America Taft and his Secretary of State, Philander Knox, instituted a policy of dollar diplomacy towards Latin America, believing U.S. investment would benefit all involved, while diminishing European influence in regions where the Monroe Doctrine applied. The policy was unpopular among Latin American states that did not wish to become financial protectorates of the United States, as well as in the U.S. Senate, many of whose members believed the U. S. should not interfere abroad. When Taft entered office, Mexico was increasingly restless under the grip of longtime dictator Porfirio Diaz. Many Mexicans backed his opponent, Francisco Madero. Nicaragua's president, Jose Santos Zelaya, wanted to revoke commercial concessions granted to American companies. Treaties among Panama, Colombia, and the United States to resolve disputes arising from the Panamanian Revolution of 1903 had been signed by the lame duck Roosevelt administration in early 1909, and were approved by the Senate and also ratified by Panama. Colombia, however, declined to ratify the treaties, and after the 1912 elections, Knox offered $10 million to the Colombians later raised to $25 million. The Colombians felt the amount inadequate, and requested arbitration. The matter was not settled under the Taft administration. East Asia Due to his years in the Philippines, Taft was keenly interested as president in East Asian affairs. In 1898, an American company had gained a concession for a railroad between Hangzhou and Sichuan but the Chinese revoked the agreement in 1904 after the company, which was indemnified for the revocation, breached the agreement by selling a majority stake outside the United States. The Chinese imperial government got the money for the indemnity from the British Hong Kong government. On condition British subjects would be favored if foreign capital was needed to build the railroad line, and in 1909, a British-led consortium began negotiations. After the revolution broke out, the revolt's leaders chose Sun Yat-sen as provisional president of what became the Republic of China, overthrowing the Manchu dynasty. Taft was reluctant to recognize the new government. Although American public opinion was in favor of it, the U.S. House of Representatives in February 1912 passed a resolution supporting a Chinese Republic, but Taft and Knox felt recognition should come as a concerted action by Western powers. Taft in his final annual message to Congress in December 1912 indicated that he was moving towards recognition once the Republic was fully established, but by then he had been defeated for re-election and he did not follow through. Taft continued the policy against immigration from China and Japan as under Roosevelt. A revised Treaty of Friendship and Navigation entered into by the U.S. and Japan in 1911 granted broad reciprocal rights to Japanese people in America and Americans in Japan, but were premised on the continuation of the Gentlemen's Agreement. There was objection on the West Coast when the treaty was submitted to the Senate but Taft informed politicians that there was no change in immigration policy. Europe Taft was opposed to the traditional practice of rewarding wealthy supporters with key ambassadorial posts, preferring that diplomats not live in a lavish lifestyle and selecting men who, as Taft put it, would recognize an American when they saw one. High on his list for dismissal was the ambassador to France. Henry White, whom Taft knew and disliked from his visits to Europe. White's ousting caused other career State Department employees to fear that their jobs might be lost to politics. Taft also wanted to replace the Roosevelt-appointed ambassador in London, White Law Reed, but Reed, owner of the New York Tribune, had backed Taft during the campaign, and both William and Nellie Taft enjoyed his gossipy reports. Reed remained in place until his 1912 death.
Taft was a supporter of settling international disputes by arbitration, and he negotiated treaties with Great Britain and with France, providing that differences be arbitrated. These were signed in August 1911. Neither Taft nor Knox, a former senator, consulted with members of the Senate during the negotiating process. By then many Republicans were opposed to Taft and the president felt that lobbying too hard for the treaties might cause their defeat. He made some speeches supporting the treaties in October, but the Senate added amendments Taft could not accept, killing the agreements. Although no general arbitration treaty was entered into, Taft's administration settled several disputes with Great Britain by peaceful means often involving arbitration. These included a settlement of the boundary between Maine and New Brunswick, a long-running dispute over seal hunting in the Bering Sea that also involved Japan, and a similar disagreement regarding fishing off Newfoundland. The Sealing Convention remained in force until abrogated by Japan in 1940. Domestic Policies and Politics Antitrust Taft continued and expanded Roosevelt's efforts to break up business combinations through lawsuits brought under the Sherman Antitrust Act, bringing 70 cases in four years. Roosevelt had brought 40 in seven years. Suits brought against the Standard Oil Company and the American Tobacco Company, initiated under Roosevelt, were decided in favor of the government by the Supreme Court in 1911. In October 1911, Taft's Justice Department brought suit against U.S. Steel, demanding that over a hundred of its subsidiaries be granted corporate independence, and naming as defendants many prominent business executives and financiers. The pleadings in the case had not been reviewed by Taft, and alleged that Roosevelt had fostered monopoly, and had been duped by clever industrialists. Taft sent a special message to Congress on the need for a revamped antitrust statute when it convened its regular session in December 1911. But it took no action. Another antitrust case that had political repercussions for Taft was that brought against the International Harvester Company, the large manufacturer of farm equipment. In early 1912, as Roosevelt's administration had investigated International Harvester, but had taken no action, a decision Taft had supported. The suit became caught up in Roosevelt's challenge for the Republican presidential nomination. Supporters of Taft alleged that Roosevelt had acted improperly. The former president blasted Taft for waiting three and a half years, and until he was under challenge, to reverse a decision he had supported. Bollinger-Pinchot Affair Roosevelt was an ardent conservationist, assisted in this by like-minded appointees, including Interior Secretary James R. Garfield. Roosevelt had withdrawn much land from the public domain, including some in Alaska thought rich in coal. In 1902, Clarence Cunningham, an Idaho entrepreneur, had found coal deposits in Alaska, and made mining claims and the government investigated their legality. This dragged on for the remainder of the Roosevelt administration, including during the year when Bollinger served as head of the General Land Office. In September 1909, Clavis made his allegations public in a magazine article, disclosing that Bollinger had acted as an attorney for Cunningham between his two periods of government service. This violated conflict of interest rules forbidding a former government official from advocacy on a matter he had been responsible for. Taft had ordered government officials not to comment on the fracas. Civil Rights Taft announced in his inaugural address that he would not appoint African Americans to federal jobs, such as postmaster, where this would cause racial friction. This differed from Roosevelt, who would not remove or replace black office holders with whom local whites would not deal, term Taft's Southern policy. This stance effectively invited white protests against black appointees. Taft followed through, removing most black office holders in the South, 
and made few appointments from that race in the north. At the time Taft was inaugurated, the way forward for African Americans was debated by their leaders. Booker T. Washington felt that most blacks should be trained for industrial work, with only a few seeking higher education. W. E. B. Du Bois took a more militant stand for equality. Taft tended towards Washington's approach. According to Coletta, Taft let the African American be kept in his place. He thus failed to see or follow the humanitarian mission historically associated with the Republican Party, with the result that Negroes both North and South began to drift toward the Democratic Party. Quote, a supporter of free immigration, Taft vetoed the bill passed by Congress and supported by labor unions that would have restricted unskilled laborers by imposing a literacy test. Judicial Appointments Taft made six appointments to the Supreme Court, the most of any president except George Washington and Franklin D. Roosevelt. Just as David Josiah Brewer's death on March 28, 1910 gave Taft a second opportunity to fill a seat on the high court. He chose New York Governor Charles Evans Hughes. Taft told Hughes that should the chief justiceship fall vacant during his term, Hughes would be his likely choice for the center seat. The Senate quickly confirmed Hughes. But then Chief Justice Fuller died on July 4, 1910. Taft took five months to replace Fuller. And when he did, it was with Justice Edward Douglas White, who became the first Associate Justice to be promoted to Chief Justice. With the death of Justice Harlan in October 1911, Taft got to fill a sixth seat on the Supreme Court. After Secretary Knox declined appointment, Taft named Chancellor of New Jersey Malin Pitney, the last person appointed to the Supreme Court who did not attend law school. Taft appointed 13 judges to the Federal Courts of Appeal and 38 to the United States District Courts. Taft also appointed judges to various specialized courts, including the first five appointees each to the United States Commerce Court and the United States Court of Customs Appeals. 1912 Presidential Campaign and Election Moving apart from Roosevelt During Roosevelt's 15 months beyond the Atlantic, from March 1909 to June 1910, neither man wrote much to the other. Taft biographer Lurry suggested that each expected the other to make the first move to re-establish their relationship on a new footing. Upon Roosevelt's triumphant return, Taft invited him to stay at the White House. The former president declined, and in private letters to friends expressed dissatisfaction at Taft's performance. Nevertheless, he wrote that he expected Taft to be renominated by the Republicans in 1912, and did not speak of himself as a candidate. Taft and Roosevelt met twice in 1910. The meetings, though outwardly cordial, did not display their former closeness. During the 1910 midterm election campaign, Roosevelt involved himself in New York politics, while Taft with donations and influence tried to secure the election of the Republican gubernatorial candidate in Ohio, former Lieutenant Governor Warren G. Harding. The Republicans suffered losses in the 1910 elections as the Democrats took control of the House and slashed the Republican majority in the Senate. In New Jersey, Democrat Woodrow Wilson was elected governor, and Harding lost his race in Ohio. After the election, Roosevelt continued to promote progressive ideals, a new nationalism. Much to Taft's dismay, Roosevelt attacked his successor's administration, arguing that its guiding principles were not that of the party of Lincoln, but those of the Gilded Age. Roosevelt was receiving many letters from supporters urging him to run, and Republican officeholders were organizing on his behalf, balked on many policies by an unwilling Congress and courts in his full term in the White House. He saw manifestations of public support he believed would sweep him to the White House with a mandate for progressive policies that would brook no opposition. Primaries and Convention 
As Roosevelt became more radical in his progressivism, Taft was hardened in his resolve to achieve renomination, as he was convinced that the progressives threatened the very foundation of the government. Roosevelt dominated the primaries winning 278 of the 362 delegates to the Republican National Convention in Chicago decided in that manner. Taft had control of the party machinery, and it came as no surprise that he gained the bulk of the delegates decided at district or state conventions. Taft had won over Root, who agreed to run for temporary chairman of the convention, and the delegate selected Root over Roosevelt's candidate campaign in defeat. Alleging Taft had stolen the nomination, Roosevelt and his followers formed the Progressive Party. Reverting to the pre-Roosevelt custom that presidents seeking re-election did not campaign, Taft spoke publicly only once, making his nomination acceptance speech on August 1st. He had difficulty in financing the campaign, as many industrialists had concluded he could not win and would support Wilson to block Roosevelt. The president issued a confident statement in September after the Republicans narrowly won Vermont's state elections in a three-way fight, but had no illusions he would win his race. Vice President Sherman had been renominated at Chicago, seriously ill during the campaign. He died six days before the election. Return to Yale with no pension or other compensation to expect from the government after leaving the White House, Taft contemplated a return to the practice of law, from which he had long been absent. Given that Taft had appointed many federal judges, including a majority of the Supreme Court, this would raise questions of conflict of interest at every federal court appearance and he was saved from this by an offer for him to become Kent Professor of Law and Legal History at Yale Law School. He accepted, and after a month's vacation in Georgia, arrived in New Haven on April 1, 1913 to a rapturous reception. As it was too late in the semester for him to give an academic course, he instead prepared eight lectures on questions of modern government, which he delivered in May. Taft left, with President Warren G. Harding and Robert Lincoln at the dedication of the Lincoln Memorial. May 30, 1922, Taft had been made president of the Lincoln Memorial Commission while still in office, when Democrats proposed removing him for one of their party. He quipped that unlike losing the presidency, such a removal would hurt. The architect, Henry Bacon, wanted to use Colorado Yule marble while Southern Democrats urged using Georgia marble, Taft lobbied for the Western Stone, and the matter was submitted to the Commission of Fine Arts, which supported Taft and Bacon. The project went forward. Taft would dedicate the Lincoln Memorial as Chief Justice in 1922. Taft maintained a cordial relationship with Wilson. The former president privately criticized his successor on a number of issues but made his views known publicly only on Philippine policy. Taft was appalled when, after Justice Lamar's death in January 1916, Wilson nominated Brandeis, whom the former president had never forgiven for his role in the Bollinger Pinchot affair. When hearings led to nothing discreditable about Brandeis, Taft intervened with a letter signed by himself and other former ABBA presidents stating that Brandeis was not fit to serve on the Supreme Court. Nevertheless, the Democratic-controlled Senate confirmed Brandeis as president of the League to enforce peace. Taft hoped to prevent war through an international association of nations. With World War I raging in Europe, Taft sent Wilson a note of support for his foreign policy in 1915. When Wilson asked Congress to declare war on Germany in April 1917, Taft was an enthusiastic supporter. Taft was chairman of the American Red Cross Executive Committee, occupying much of the former president's time. When Wilson proposed establishment of a League of Nations, with the League's charter part of the Treaty of Versailles, Taft expressed public support. 
He was out of step with his party, whose senators were not inclined to ratify the treaty. Taft's subsequent flip-flop on the issue of whether reservations to the treaty were necessary angered both sides, destroying any remaining influence he had with the Wilson administration and causing some Republicans to call him a Wilson supporter and a traitor to his party. The Senate refused to ratify the Versailles Pact. Chief Justice Appointment During the 1920 election campaign, Taft supported the Republican ticket. Harding, by then a senator, and Massachusetts Governor Calvin Coolidge, they were elected. White by then was in failing health but made no move to resign when Harding was sworn in on March 4, 1921. It later emerged that Harding had also promised former Utah Senator George Sutherland a seat on the Supreme Court, and was waiting in the expectation that another place would become vacant. Taft's Court Membership Timeline McKinley Appointment Theodore Roosevelt Appointment Taft Appointment Wilson Appointment Harding Appointment Coolidge Appointment Jurisprudence Commerce Clause The Supreme Court, under Taft, compiled a conservative record in Commerce Clause jurisprudence. This had the practical effect of making it difficult for the federal government to regulate industry, and the Taft Court also scuttled many state laws. The few liberals on the court, Brandeis, Holmes, and from 1925, Harlan Fisk Stone, sometimes protested, believing orderly progress essential, but often joined in the majority opinion. The White Court had, in 1918, struck down an attempt by Congress to regulate child labor in Hammer v. Dagenhart, a case in which the Taft Court struck down regulation that generated a dissent from the Chief Justice was Adkins v. Children's Hospital powers of government. In 1922, Taft ruled for a unanimous court in Balzac v. Puerto Rico. In 1926, Taft wrote for a 6-3 majority in Myers v. United States. The following year, the court decided McGrain v. Daugherty. Individual rights. In 1925, the Taft Court laid the groundwork for the incorporation of many of the guarantees of the Bill of Rights to be applied against the states through the 14th Amendment. In Gidlow v. New York, Pierce v. Society of Sisters, United States v. Lanza. Administration and Political Influence Taft exercised the power of his position to influence the decisions of his colleagues urging unanimity and discouraging dissents. Alpheus Mason, in his article on Chief Justice Taft for the American Bar Association Journal, contrasted Taft's expansive view of the role of the Chief Justice with the narrow view of presidential power he took while in that office, believing that the Chief Justice should be responsible for the federal courts. Taft felt that he should have an administrative staff to assist him, and the Chief Justice should be empowered to temporarily reassign judges. The Supreme Court's docket was congested, swelled by war litigation and laws that allowed a party defeated in the Circuit Court of Appeals to have the case decided by the Supreme Court if the constitutional question was involved. Taft believed an appeal should be usually be settled by the Circuit Court, with only cases of major import decided by the justices. He and other Supreme Court members proposed legislation to make most of the court's docket discretionary, with a case getting full consideration by the justices only if they granted a writ of certiorari. To Taft's frustration, Congress took three years to consider the matter. Taft and other members of the court lobbied for the bill in Congress, and the judge's bill became law in February 1925. By late the following year, Taft was able to show that the backlog was shrinking. When Taft became Chief Justice, the court did not have its own building and met in the Capitol. Its offices were cluttered and overcrowded, but Fuller and White had been opposed to proposals to move the court to its own building. 
In 1925, Taft began a fight to get the court a building, and two years later Congress appropriated money to purchase the land. On the south side of the Capitol, Cass Gilbert had prepared plans for the building, and was hired by the government as architect. Taft had hoped to live to see the court move into the new building, but it did not do so until 1935, after Taft's death, declining health and death. Taft is remembered as the heaviest president. He was 5 feet 11 inches tall and his weight peaked at 335, 340 pounds toward the end of his presidency. At Hoover's inauguration on March 4, 1929, Taft recited part of the oath incorrectly, later writing, My memory is not always accurate, and one sometimes becomes a little uncertain, misquoting again in that letter. Differently, Taft insisted on going to Cincinnati to attend the funeral of his brother Charles, who died on December 31, 1929. The strain did not improve his own health. When the court reconvened on January 6, 1930, Taft had not returned to Washington, and two opinions were delivered by Van de Vander that Taft had drafted but had been unable to complete because of his illness. Taft went to Asheville, North Carolina for a rest, but by the end of January, he could barely speak and was suffering from hallucinations. Three days following his death, on March 11, he became the first president and first member of the Supreme Court to be buried at Arlington National Cemetery. Legacy and Historical View Lurie argued that Taft did not receive the public credit for his policies that he should have. Few trusts had been broken up under Roosevelt. Although the lawsuits received much publicity, Taft, more quietly than his predecessor, filed many more cases than did Roosevelt, and rejected his predecessor's contention that there was such a thing as a good trust. This lack of flair marred Taft's presidency. According to Lurie, Taft was boring, honest, likable, but boring. Mason called Taft's years in the White House, undistinguished, inevitably linked with Roosevelt. Taft generally falls in the shadow of the flamboyant rough rider, who chose him to be president, and who took it away. Taft was convinced he would be vindicated by history. After he left office, he was estimated to be about in the middle of U.S presidents by greatness, and subsequent rankings by historians have by and large sustained that verdict. Coletta noted that this place is Taft in good company, with James Madison, John Quincy Adams and McKinley. Taft has been rated among the greatest of the Chief Justices. The house in Cincinnati where Taft was born and lived as a boy is now the William Howard Taft National Historic Site. While the fabled cherry trees in Washington represent a suitable monument for Nellie Taft, there is no memorial to her husband, except perhaps the magnificent home for his court, one for which he eagerly planned. But he died even before ground was broken for the structure, as he reacted to his overwhelming defeat for re-election in 1912. Taft had written that, I must wait for years if I would be vindicated by the people. I am content to wait. Perhaps he has waited long enough. Media
side, and easily defeated William Jennings Bryan for the presidency that November. In the White House, he focused on East Asia more than European affairs, and repeatedly intervened to prop up or remove Latin American governments. Taft sought reductions to trade tariffs, then a major source of governmental income, but the resulting bill was heavily influenced by special interests. His administration was filled with conflict between the conservative wing of the Republican Party, with which Taft often sympathized, and the progressive wing, toward which Roosevelt moved more and more. Controversies over conservation and over antitrust cases filed by the Taft administration served to further separate the two men. Roosevelt challenged Taft for renomination in 1912. Taft used his control of the party machinery to gain a bare majority of delegates, and Roosevelt bolted the party. The split left Taft with little chance of re-election. He took only Utah and Vermont in Wilson's victory. After leaving office, Taft returned to Yale as a professor, continuing his political activity and working against war through the League to enforce peace. In 1921, President Harding appointed Taft as Chief Justice, an office he had long sought. Chief Justice Taft was a conservative on business issues, but under him, there were advances in individual rights, in poor health. He resigned in February 1930. After his death the next month, he was buried at Arlington National Cemetery, the first president and first piling up. He worked to eliminate the backlog, while simultaneously educating himself on federal law and procedure he had not needed as an Ohio state judge. New York Senator William M. Everts, a former Secretary of State, had been a classmate of Alfonso Taft at Yale. Although Taft was successful as Solicitor General, winning 15 of the 18 cases he argued before the Supreme Court. Federal Judge Taft's federal judgeship was a lifetime appointment, and one from which promotion to the Supreme Court might come. Taft's older half-brother Charles, successful in business, supplemented Taft's government salary, allowing William and Nellie Taft and their family to live in comfort. Taft's duties involved hearing trials in the circuit, which included Ohio, Michigan, Kentucky, and Tennessee, and participating with Supreme Court Justice John Marshall Harlan, the circuit justice, and judges of the Sixth Circuit in hearing appeals. Taft spent these years, from 1892 to 1900, in personal and professional contentment. According to historian Louis L. Gould, while Taft shared the fears about social unrest that dominated the middle classes during the 1890s, he was not as conservative as his critics believed. He supported the right of labor to organize and strike, and he ruled against employers in several negligence cases. Quote, in 1896, Taft became Dean and Professor of Property at his alma mater, the Cincinnati Law School. William Howard Taft served as the 27th President of the United States and as the 10th Chief Justice of the United States, the only person to have held both offices. Taft was elected President in 1908, the chosen successor of Theodore Roosevelt but was defeated for re-election by Woodrow Wilson in 1912 after Roosevelt split the Republican vote by running as a third-party candidate. In 1921, President Warren G. Harding appointed Taft to be Chief Justice, a position in which he served until a month before his death. Taft was born in Cincinnati in 1857. His father, Alfonso Taft, was a U.S. Attorney General and Secretary of War, William Taft attended Yale and was a member of Skull and Bone Secret Society like his father, and after becoming a lawyer was appointed a judge while still in his twenties. He continued a rapid rise, being named Solicitor General and as a judge of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. In 1901, President William McKinley appointed Taft civilian governor of the Philippines. In 1904, 
Roosevelt made him Secretary of War, and he became Roosevelt's hand-picked successor. Despite his personal ambition to become Chief Justice, Taft declined repeated offers of appointment to the Supreme Court of the United States, believing his political work to be more important. With Roosevelt's help, Taft had little opposition for the Republican nomination for president in 1908. Supreme Court justice to be entered there. Taft is generally listed near the middle in historians' rankings of U.S. presidents. Early Life and Education William Howard Taft was born September 15, 1857 in Cincinnati, Ohio, to Alfonso Taft and Louise Torrey. William Taft was not seen as brilliant as a child, but was a hard worker. Taft's demanding parents pushed him and his four brothers toward success, tolerating nothing less. He attended Woodward High School in Cincinnati, at Yale College, which he entered in 1874. The heavyset, jovial Taft was popular. One classmate described him succeeding through hard work rather than being the smartest, and as having integrity. Rise in Government Ohio Lawyer and Judge After admission to the Ohio Bar, Taft devoted himself to his job at the commercial, full-time. Halstead was willing to take him on permanently at an increase in salary if he would give up the law, but Taft declined. In October 1880, Taft was appointed assistant prosecutor for Hamilton County, where Cincinnati is located, and took office the following January. Taft served for a year as assistant prosecutor, trying his share of routine cases. In 1887, Taft, then aged 29, was appointed to a vacancy on the Superior Court of Cincinnati by Governor Joseph B. Foraker. The appointment was good for just over a year, after which he would have to face the voters. And in April 1888, he sought election for the first of three times in his lifetime, the other two being for the presidency. He was elected to a full five-year term. Some two dozen of Taft's opinions as state judge survive, the most significant being Moores & Co. v. Bricklayers Union No. 1. It is not clear when Taft met Helen Herron, often called Nellie, but it was no later than 1880, when she mentioned in her diary receiving an invitation to a party from him. By 1884, they were meeting regularly, and in 1885, after an initial rejection, she agreed to marry him. The wedding took place at the Heron home on June 19, 1886. William Taft remained devoted to his wife throughout their almost 44 years of marriage. Nellie Taft pushed her husband much as his parents had, and she could be very frank with her criticisms. Solicitor General There was a seat vacant on the U.S. Supreme Court in 1889 and Governor Foraker suggested President Harrison appoint Taft to fill it. Taft was 32 and his professional goal was always a seat on the Supreme Court. He actively sought the appointment, writing to Foraker to urge the governor to press his case, while stating to others it was unlikely he would get it. Instead, in 1890, Harrison appointed him Solicitor General of the United States. When Taft arrived in Washington in February 1890, the office had been vacant two months. With the work 